There we go. We're live. All right. Oach, what's happening? Not much. How you doing? Thanks, everyone, for joining. Looking forward to doing this. Yeah, I'm pumped about this. We got people filtering in now. Um, so uh, as we as we kind of wait for folks to get in here, I want to just give a quick intro to what's happening today. Um, we're going to be obviously talking a lot about uh, hitting biomechanics, um, which, you know, uh, has been a program that Hitrex has recently added to the software. It's also something that, Jason, you have a, a pretty extensive background in starting at your days, you know, as as the founder of Driveline Hitting. Um, you know, your work writing, hacking the kinetic chain hitting, uh, and obviously with your time with the with the Phillies and now uh, over in Boston with the Sox. So um, I'm excited to go through this. I uh, I do appreciate you joining. Um, I want to give a, a, a quick intro to the software, but uh, Oach, again, as always, we appreciate your support and um, and thank you for taking the time to to give some valuable insight here. This I think is going to help uh, a lot of coaches on this topic. You bet, man. No, I'm excited, and I remember talking to you about this technology years ago. You know, thinking about how this was the future, and this is what you guys are trying to build, and you know, I, I thought it would take a couple more years, but kudos to you guys for, for rolling it out. And I think it's really going to help a ton of coaches and a ton of players and, and help the industry, you know, just, just move forward and learn a lot about biomechanics. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of my perspective from uh, my experience with it. But um, ultimately, I'm just really excited about the future and what this can do for, uh, you know, for, for, for our, our group as hitting, hitting coaches and hitters. Yeah, kind of get, getting more people involved, getting more collective data. Um, putting this, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the, the analytics in general, um, the, uh, you know, the top level MLB teams, college teams have access to this data, big budgets to spend, um, facilities at the amateur level, maybe, you know, have not had access to this information. So that's kind of the idea here is now people can get that info uh, and utilize it. So what I'd love to do real quick, before we hop into the webinar is just show you what we're talking about, um, uh, Hitrax has added uh, biomechanics to the software, which is powered by 3Motion AI. Um, and if I swap my screen here, I'll see if I can do this. There we go. Um, I'm not going to upload any videos, but the idea here is that, you know, typically, and, and you have access to a uh, to a, a, an unbelievable lab at Driveline and at your professional teams in these um, these labs that you visited, right? They're they are extensive setups. Um, and what we've done here... Uh, through free motion AI, some people may know them as ProPlay AI, um, is we're taking our video camera uh, feature that we've used and we're putting it just directly side by side with the batter. Um, they don't have to strap up with anything. We don't need any other perspectives or angles. Um, and just from that video, they're able to take a swing and in the session, upload a hit and spit out the data here that you're going to see. And uh, it's around 30 to 60 seconds, hopefully. As this continues after phase one, that'll be closer and closer and closer to real time. Um, but you'll get all of this information. And I'm not going to go through these metrics here, but you'll see uh, shoulder and pelvis balance, head, torso, stride length, et cetera, uh, a lot of the things that you're going to be referring to here. So um, keep all of that in mind. I'm going to swap back over here. And uh, and Jason, I'm going to let you run. So I'm, I'm excited about this topic again. And uh, and uh, we'll let it rip. Sounds good. Yeah, so I'll start with just a quick outline on what we're going to talk about. So we'll do a quick intro and then um, we'll talk about biomechanics, kind of define what they are, um, you know, what, what the data is and, and why it's so important to what we do as coaches and, and, and to the future of, of hitting development. And then as we get into the swing, uh, the way we're going to do it is we'll break the swing down into phases. So we have three different phases, the load, the stride and the swing. And uh, we'll break down each phase individually. Um, so a little intro on myself. You mentioned I, I started as a, a college baseball coach at a small NAI in California. Did that for three years. Um, in 2016, Kyle Bodie, the founder of Driveline, you know, found me online, actually. And, and I, I was kind of sharing some of the stuff we were doing at Menlo. Um, and he interviewed me to, to build the hitting department. Because at the time, they were just doing pitching. And they wanted to build a data-driven hitting development program. So I, I took that job and started in 2016 from scratch. And um, it's been fun to watch this thing grow over the years. And, and one of the things that's most exciting for me is, is the hitting biomechanics. 
you know, we we really kind of rolled that out full speed into our you know assessment and and player development system. Kind of last year, maybe a little a little before that, um, there was a lot of data collection that went into it beforehand, and um, you know, I th I think we have some pretty interesting insights that I'm looking forward to sharing with all you guys. Um, the last four years, I was the hitting coordinator with the Phillies, and then and uh, as Andrew mentioned, I'm now with Boston, so I've had quite a bit of experience with um, eye level hitters and, and, and biomechanics data, and and I think um, you know I can I can provide some interesting insight for you guys. I, I can vouch for that too. Just as you get rolling here, um, I, I'm just reading through the biomechanics chapter of your book, which we'll talk a little bit more about at the end. Uh, I think what you'll see today that's important is you're able to communicate this in ways that amateur coaches can understand this, that you, you know, kind of what you said, you don't have to have, you know, a degree in, in kinesiology to understand what's going on here. So um, I, I think that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a nice uh, reminder that, that I wanted to note that, you know, I'm not a biomechanist. I, I am a, a coach and I'm making this presentation for coaches and I, I have the pleasure of working with some biomechanists, but um, you know, I'm hoping that this information is, is, um, you know, te technically, um, you know, useful for, for everyone, whether you're an expert or, or you have no familiarity with the stuff. And I, I think as it, when it comes to using new tech, which, which this will be for a lot of guys, like the best way you can, you can learn it is just to get in there and, and mess with it. Right. And that's what I think is going to be so exciting for you guys as you start to get this sort of information on a swing by swing basis. And, and, and in real time, um, you, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to learn a lot by just kind of digging through, asking questions, kind of comparing swings and, over time, you'll start to, to really understand it at a high level. Uh, biomechanics, typically they're broken up into either kinematics or kinetics. So what we're talking about in this presentation and, and typically when uh, baseball biomechanics are discussed, we're talking about kinematics. So what those are, are the description of the motion itself. So what is the torso doing? How is it moving? How fast is it moving? Where is it in space? Like things like that that describe the motion itself, that's kinematics and, and that's what this technology does. So typically it looks at segments of the swing or sorry, segments of the body. So for instance, the arm or the hands, the head, the torso, pelvis, et cetera. Um, you could look at joints. So how much extension is happening at a joint, maybe the knee joint or the hips or, or the elbows or the center of mass. So it's gonna tell us how these things are moving and, and how fast they're moving. And typically, that information is shared either with data in the form of a graph or in a visual like we're seeing on the right here with this uh, like skeleton like uh, visual that that uh, Andrew showed earlier. So um, when it comes to, to, to biomechanics, typically with the collection process will use either markered or markerless. So markered is, is what I've had experience with in the past, and that's either using um, you know, some sort of accelerometer or, or, or technology that the athlete has to wear. Um, markerless is what this is. And this is, you know, probably the, the future and, and I guess the present of hitting biomechanics for coaches because the turnaround time is really quick. As you, as you saw with, with Andrew, I mean, you take a swing and within a minute or less, you're getting biomechanics data, which is just awesome. Um, and to be able to pair that with video and the batted ball data, is just incredible. So as far as what typically gets measured, we talked about velocities and positions, so how fast things are moving, and that'll be expressed either rotationally or linearly. So thinking about rotationally, typically we're talking about like the pelvis or the torso, right? How fast is that segment rotating throughout time? And it's typically expressed in, in degrees, per, degrees per second. Um, linear speed is, is generally expressed in miles per hour. So think about how people talk about bat speed or, or hand speed, for instance, you're looking more about how much space is covered over time. So it's, it's a measurement of distance over time. Positions, we can look at global positions. So where they are, where a segment is in relation to just like the ground, so to speak. And relative would be looking at, say, the torso in relation to the pelvis. So for instance, if we're looking at how much a hitter is, is coiling during the load, you might say that the torso is turning 20 degrees. But if the pelvis is turning 20 degrees underneath it, the torso is not actually moving itself independent of the lower half. It's moving globally, but not relatively, right? It's just something to think about as you look through this information. So why do they matter? I mean, speaking of obvious here, but I think as an industry, we've done a really good job of, of understanding battle ball data. 
and, and using that to, you know, make assessments on, on players and understand, you know, what their strengths and weaknesses are. How hard do they hit the ball? Do they make consistent contact? Do they swing on good pitches? Uh, and hit tracks is a is a great tool for that. But taking it to the next level and kind of peeling the the next layer is is looking into the how, right? So the battle ball data tells us what's happening. And, and baseball is a tremendous sport for understanding kind of performance results because we can just measure what's happening out, out on the field. But this is the next step in really understanding how, right? And, and the next point I have on there is paired data is key. I can tell you just for the last two years, it's been such a process to pair our biomech data with battle ball data and video. I mean, it takes like a large group of like highly technically skilled individuals to pair all that data and analysts and all that stuff. And the fact that they can do it now all on hit tracks easily is just incredible. It, it's a huge development for hitting. And, um, you know, it's it, it's really, really exciting. I, I truly believe that Biomech is, is the next frontier in hitting player development. You know, I think we we all are swing coaches and we talk about the swing a lot, but as far as really understanding it and having data to support our, our opinions, there's not a ton out there. Like there's certainly some research articles out there, but a lot of times they're limited to, um, you know, the quality of the, the player or the environment they're hitting in. That's a lot of stuff on like T-work or flips. Um, or hit tracks is, is going to allow us to gather a lot of, of, of data on a, on a lot of hitters. So as far as the process and, and more logically how, how I think through these things, it all starts with the end goal, right? Like what's the model we're building after? So we can ask that question, what, what matters in hitting? And then part two is what contributes to that, right? And, and this is sort of the logic of, of how we build our process. And then step three is, can we teach it? And that's where coaching comes in. So, so one example would be bat the ball skills, which is something I'm particularly interested in. And what I mean by that is that ability to make consistent contact, right? Do you swing where the ball is? Can you hit off time? Are you adjustable? So on and so forth. So we know that matters in hitting. That's step one. Now we can start to look at what contribute, like what mechanical attributes contribute to high bat to ball skills, right? So maybe at, on your team or at your facility, and it's a really easy way to kind of test this would be take your highest bat to ball guys and, and then, and, and your worst and, and start to look at them. Like, collect some data under swing and start to see, okay, what is it about these guys' swings, or these girls' swings that are allowing them to be more adjustable or to have more bat-to-ball skills, right? So that sort of logic um, and pairing it with the, with the data, I think is how we can start to answer a lot of these really interesting questions that we have as hitting coaches. And, and the last point, which I think is most exciting, is that this is really is, is mostly uncharted territory. And that's what I'm so excited about. And I mean, it's it's totally possible that, you know, someone on this Zoom call <laughs> uncovers something um, groundbreaking in, in the world of hitting, because right now, I think when it comes to mechanics, like I said, we have a lot of our ideas and there's certainly amazing swing coaches out there. But there's there, there's a lot to be learned as far as what uh, great mechanics are for hitting and how to teach them. Yeah, I think that's honestly that is why we're doing this webinar is because people have asked us, they see that the numbers and the metrics that are provided and they're saying, well, okay, you know, what is good? What, what is a, you know, what is a good shoulder angle at contact? What's a good, you know, stride length. And, you know, the answer is like you said, and like you outlined in your book, there's some key points, but it's going to vary based on every single player, based on their height, based on their body, their, their, um, you know, their flexibility and, and their ability to rotate. I, I think um, we'll get some clarity on that here, but also there's a lot that people will learn as they start to use this about each individual guy. Totally, totally. And, and I think um, when it comes to variation, I mean, that, that's the first thing we learned as we collected this data. And then at Driveline, we've had, you know, hundreds, uh, several hundred swings uh, or several hundred different hitters, thousands of swings in our, in our biomic lab, including some of the best players in baseball and, 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 you know, amateurs that, that play at every level of the game. And what we've seen, even just amongst our best guys is there is quite a bit of variation in, in style. Right. So it makes sense when, when, um, when you think about the nature of hitting, right. So when you compare it to pitching uh, it's, it's kind of a close skill. You're repeating a, a motion throwing to like the same area for the most part or hitting. It's, it's just a different skill. It's an open skill. It's reactive. Um, so we see variation both when we talk about comparing one athlete to another athlete, uh, but we also see variation when we look at one swing to another swing 
of the same hitter, if that makes sense. And that's especially true if we're looking at game data, right? So good hitting can be ugly sometimes. And I think as coaches, it's, it's our job to help the hitter find their best swing. And some of those things that Andrew talked about, the mobility, the player type, the, the way that they move, all those things factor in um, to, to this sort of equation. But at the end of the day, there is no one perfect pattern, right? And I think that's a trap that a lot of hitters fall into is they try and, and you know, repeat one swing over and over and try and mimic someone they see on TV or whatever. But at the end of the day, there is no one perfect pattern. And um, it's quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, our, our best hitters actually are, are not repeatable. They're able to repeat good outcomes by having an unrepeatable swing. And they have movement solutions to different pitch types, different pitch locations. Uh, they're able to adjust hard to soft. They're able to, you know, be out front, foul pitch off, whatever it may be. Like, like good hitting is, is ugly sometimes. So with that being said, there are some common mechanical traits amongst our best. And, and um, I'll talk through some of that as we move forward here and, and talk about some of the ranges of, of positions and, and velocities that they get into. So are before we start, also, um, go ahead. Sorry, real quick. I see some questions coming through the Q&A. Um, uh, we've got our team that's going to answer questions uh, related to hit tracks or questions that we can answer, but we are going to do a Q&A session at the end. So write those questions in, keep them there. Um, we're going to get to those at the end and we'll go through those uh, in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Sorry, keep rolling. Wait. Um, yeah, thanks for the questions. Appreciate that. Um, so as far as uh, defining some swing turns before we move forward, we'll, we'll talk about the pelvis and, and the torso a lot, which are depicted here in the top right in those images. We'll talk about the center of mass, which is something that uh, hit tracks measures. And that's basically depicted by this bottom left picture about where the belt buckle is. It's the center point of, of, the, of the hitter. Um, it can tell us about stride, speed, stride direction, so on and so forth. But um, we'll refer to that as center of mass and we'll use COM as an abbreviation. And then kinematic sequencing, something you, you maybe have heard before, but the concept is um, it's, it's basically looking at the rotational speeds of different segments of the swing. So looking at like the pelvis to the torso, to the arm, and then up through the kinetic chain with the concept being that energy is gonna be transferred from one to the next as they move through the, uh, through the swing. So um, we'll, we'll talk about those three phases really quick and how we define them. I think it's important to be really specific about how we define these phases and maybe you, you use different terminology and that's fine, but just for the point of this, um, this presentation, I wanna be really clear. So we talk about the load phase. This begins when the hitter's center of mass starts to load back. So think about it as like the weight shift. As they start moving back, that triggers the start of the load phase and it ends as soon as that hitter reaches that rearmost point and starts to, to do that forward move. And, and you can see on the right of this video here, within hit tracks, you can, um, you can track that center of mass movement relative to your setup, which is a really cool feature. So that's the load phase. And you, and so essentially when the player in that aspect starts to move forward, then you kind of transition out. So you have this like this load and this coiling that you'll talk to. But uh, one quick question here is, I, I asked you this the other day, are you seeing like, is every player going back? Is that just what, is that what these guys do? Are they all loading? Are they all coiling, coming back slightly before um, moving forward into the swing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there are a couple that really preset their weight over their backside so that they're kind of already in a loaded position. And then when they lift that front leg, they kind of move forward. But for the most part, I mean, the overwhelming majority of hitters will have a lateral sway, which I know is sometimes a bad word in hitting, but it's just the reality. Like there is a sway back and I'll talk about that and why that's important um, in one of these slides coming up. But yeah, good question. Um, the next phase is the stride phase. So we talked about it beginning when that center of mass starts to move forward and that ends at heel strike. So as soon as that, that hitter's front heel hits the ground, that's the end of what we're calling the, the stride phase. The third phase is the swing phase, probably the most important, but um, I mean, they're all important, but this is when the actual swing is occurring. So it starts at front foot plant and it ends at contact. So let's start with the load and we'll, we'll talk about just the purpose of it. And, and this is, is um, you know, stuff you guys probably already know, but generally speaking, there's a few reasons guys will, will have a load, right? For one is to uh, gather energy. 
and I have on there unilaterally, which means on one leg. So that so hitting, I know we we might feel like we're it's, it's a two-legged movement, and guys like talking about getting to 50-50 and this and that, but having access to force plate data, hitting is largely a, a unilateral movement. So during that load, everything's on the back leg, and then once that front heel gets down, most of the weight shifts to the front, and, and most guys completely unweight that back leg. So it really is a, a unilateral movement. So that ability to gather energy on the backside before going into forward rotation is, is huge. Um, it, it's it's the start of the timing mechanism, of course, and a big part of it too is just getting positioned correctly. So as we transition into that stride phase, we want to be in a good spot so that we can, um, you know, be in an athletic position to to move into our stride in a dynamic way. Um, this this is where a lot of the you know pitch recognition is starting to happen. So it, it's a really important phase. And, and I'll say this all the time, but the swing's not going to end well if it, if it doesn't start well. So a lot of times we'll see issues in the swing or in the stride that are, are caused by things here that, that go wrong in the load phase, right? And sometimes issues earlier in the swing kind of reveal themselves upstream, and that happens a lot with the load. So first checkpoint we look at, which uh, you, you asked the question, um, is that center of mass shifting back before the, the, the hitter unweights that lead leg. So when you think about it from, a, from just like a physics standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. So if you start, let's say 50-50 between your, your two legs, and then you lift that front leg up, it's, it's basic physics, you're gonna fall forward, right? And this is something a lot of hitters do, is they crash forward and they can't control their forward move because they're lifting that front leg too early, right? So virtually every hitter is going to have a, a slight sway back to kind of get their center of mass more over that back leg so that when they unweight that front leg, they're under control, they're balanced, and they're able to move into the forward move in a really controlled, powerful fashion. So again, you can see that on hit tracks and uh, you can certainly observe it when you watch haters that lift that leg too early. Um, maybe they're trying to be really quick or simple and, and they're actually making the swing more complicated by, by taking out a really necessary, subtle but necessary move. and Looking at these two videos on the bottom, I chose these two because they're kind of extremes. Goldschmidt in the bottom left is a very subtle, probably three, four inch sway back before he lifts up. He, he really gets close to that hitting position um, in the setup where Harper is just like a much more dynamic mover. And he really gets back there probably a foot, maybe even more before he lifts that front foot off the ground. So as far as the common flaws, you know, we talked about falling forward. If that center of mass is, is too far forward, um, as that leg gets off the ground, that hitter is just going to crash forward. Checkpoint number two, this, this is the big one, making sure that during the load phase, the pelvis and the, and the torso are, are coiling together. That's, that's the first thing. And then with minimal separation. So by coiling together, what I mean is as they start to rotate for a right-handed hitter to the right, we don't want to see a lot of separation happening between those two uh, segments. We're going to see that later on in the swing towards the end of the stride. But as they start to load, generally the, the pelvis and the torso are going to be pretty square in relation to one another. Okay, so some data for you, just looking at our best hitters in gym. On average, at the end of the load phase, guys will be at about eight degrees of coil. So they're still pretty square um, and about five degrees of separation. So there's, there's some vari variation there, but, but not a whole lot. And guys will add torsal coil later on during the stride to get to about 20, which is about the average for, uh, for guys as far as like their max torsal coil. But at the end of the load phase, they are pretty square. And so if you look at Dom here, who this is his data, when he gets to this position at, at the um, end of the load phase, he has 26 degrees of shoulder turn, of torsal coil. 16.5 degrees of pelvis coil and 10 degrees of separation. So th that's a lot of movement this early in the swing. Um, and it's something I would certainly try and tighten up if, if I was working with them. And that's just one way to, to look at this with hit tracks and kind of get a good idea of where they are. And, and if, while, while I'm on the topic, it's, it's a pretty common thing to see when guys are hitting really easy practice. So like flips, T work, especially got guys will really, really over coil and turn. Um, and so it's just another reason to be sure you're challenging your guys in practice to, to make sure they're getting their game swing off. This overhead view too is an awesome way to, to kind of get a, 
a, a good angle of it, um, you can really see how those those two segments are interacting with one another. So as, as far as uh, common flaws, torso oh, pullback. Uh, I was yeah. just, just going to say on that real quick while we can, because I think this is an important part for, um, for as far as questions that I've got, have you, can you still see the, yeah. can you see the biomechanics here now? Yeah. Okay. So um, if we go to the shoulder versus pelvis here, and then we, and we open up this stick figure that you saw in your, in the, uh, uh, in the picture, right. You can rotate here and, and view from the top, like you showed. Um, one of the one of the biggest questions that I get is, you know, the X factor. What you know, what is a good X factor? And you kind of just define that for us. The X factor is this: it's the separation of the shoulders and the pelvis. And from what you were describing there, really at the load phase, uh, there should not be a ton of separation, right? So, it, it kind of to your point, as you see this here in real time, Dom's shoulders are really turning, and in this instance, he's hitting off a machine. Um, you know, throwing the same velocity uh, throughout throughout the entire round, and that may be an example of what you're talking about of something that's too easy or or just nothing that's going to challenge him to where he has time and he knows what's going to happen. And if you do that in a game, if you're if you're coiling your shoulders that much in a game, you know, and somebody throws a ball 93 miles an hour on the outside corner, how are you going to get around to that? Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, and from a uh... From a physiological standpoint, too, that the logic there is that the torso eventually needs to rotate rapidly into the swing, and the muscles that rotate your torso are, are your core and your oblique muscles, right? And and they have an elastic effect. So when you stretch those muscles, if you contract them soon after they're stretched, you can um, you can use what's called the stretch shortening cycle and get a lot of 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 speed and and uh, velocity from those muscles more so than you could um, just by themselves by utilize, utilizing that stretch shortening cycle, right? So the timing of when you stretch your core muscles is huge. So what happens with a lot of guys is they overstretch these muscles early in the swing and, and then they're not able to utilize that, that elastic ability as they get into the, the, the stride and as they get to the point where they need to launch their swing. Um, Let's go to the next one. Um, checkpoint number three. This one. This one's not uh, really like something you could measure necessarily, but just more subjective. Just being balanced, early, under control, and, and just powerful and athletic. So many hitters I work with, especially amateurs, they they start late. Um, they really get rushed and they and and they fall. And, and I tell you, it's like it, it's very obvious when you work with really good hitters just how early they're starting. Like whether you're flipping to them or throwing BP, it's like. They're kind of dancing with you. They're really up early. And it goes back to the, some of the earlier checkpoints where it's like, if you have a good setup and you're able to control your, your load and your stride, you can start early. You can, almost can't start too early because you're under control and you don't have to time the pitcher from the second you get your foot up. So that, that's another checkpoint that is, that is huge. So a couple of drills that, that are good for um, addressing the load phase. Personal favorite is probably the hook drill. So it's the one on the top. The hitter starts with their, their front foot hooked around their back foot. And the reason we do this is it presets the center of mass kind of over that back foot, right? We want the, the hitter to mostly be on the back leg um, as far as like controlling their weight. We want that, that front leg that's hooked over to, to be mostly unweighted. So they really feel under control in that heel and the back leg. And then it presets the pelvis and the torso coil like we talked about. So they, they can't overstretch. They can't um, get too much uh, separation between pelvis and coral, coil, uh, pelvis and torso from that position. So they start there and then they very slowly under control, just go into their stride and into the swing. The second one is the step back. This is great for just getting rhythm and athleticism into the swing. Um, again, it, it aligns the pelvis and torso well when, when done correctly. And it's just a, a good way to get guys rhythmic and, and, and sequencing well when it comes to how they load. So just a step back, really simple, under control, slow. I don't want this drill to be a jump. That, that's how it gets done poorly a lot is guys jump into it and go. And it, that's not the point of the drill. It's, it's a rhythm drill. So start kind of narrow and just step back really under control and then go into your swing. So going into the stride phase, 
purpose is uh, obviously timing and adjustability. So I think that's a misconception when it comes to the stride. A lot of hitters think it's a it's a power creation mechanism where I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. When you design your stride, whether it's you know a leg kick or toe tap or whatever it is, this could be said of the load and the stride. The primary goal should probably be timing and, and adjustability and direction. So if you look at um, Miguel Cabrera here, it's it's two videos overlaid. One's a high fastball and one's a, a slow breaking ball. So you can see as he gets to the loaded position and he goes through his load, the, the swings are the same, right? He's getting to the same spot. But as he moves forward into his stride, you know, one on one of the swings, his foot's getting down a little earlier. And, and and then his hands are staying up higher in the high fastball. His posture is is getting more forward bend on the low pitch. There's ways for him to be adjustable from the same position. And, and that's key. And I think that's the sign of a good stride is that we're able to, to be athletic and be dynamic and then have good direction through through the baseball. Um, it also is, it, it's sort of the, it's sort of the beginning of the blend from linear to rotational. So I know there's a, a linear versus rotational debate in hitting and the, and the reality is that it's both. It, it's a blend of linear and rotational movements. The stride is largely linear, but as that front foot gets down, the pelvis starts to turn and it, and it starts to become a, a rotational movement especially when talking about the, the pelvis and the torso. And then lastly, landing in a good hitting position. So checkpoint number one, making sure that pelvis is rotating into foot plant. And while that's happening, the torso is resisting. So we, we talked about not overstretching during the load phase. At the end of the stride phase, as that front foot is getting down, as that we get into heel strike, that's when we, we start to see separation occur. And you can see in that first gif with Boba Shet, it's a great visual because you can see his upper body and his hands are, are barely moving at all while his pelvis is rotating into foot plan. That primes those core muscles and, and it gets him into that position to where now he can rapidly rotate that torso with, with speed and precision and, and space into the hitting zone. So um, you can look at that with, uh, with hit tracks. So as you kind of scrub through it, I did that with this video, Dom went down the foot plant and, and you can measure the X factor. You can look at the torso angles, you can look at the pelvis angles and you can, you can get some idea of, of where he's at at that position. So this was, this was one of the most interesting things that I, I took away from this is his pelvis angle is, is just the fact that, you know, I, I feel like this is a movement that as coaches is talked about a lot because when you do slightly open your pelvis at, you know, heel strike, we call it heel strike. Um, you can feel that stretch in your core, right? And coaches talk about that a lot. So it's not, this isn't necessarily something that is, is brand new. We're, we're, you know, discovering like, yeah, that, that is a legitimate part of creating force and we can quantify and say, all right, you know, hopefully you can be at, you know, approximately this angle or open up this much at heel strike. Um, so that's, you know, right here, you can, you can run to heel strike quickly and just see, you know, Dom is at 16 degrees and then at heel strike starts to open up about 12, 10, 11 degrees um, to get that, that, you know, early movement that you're talking about. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. So as far as a couple common flaws, first one is that pelvis landing closed. So a lot of times guys will, they won't rotate that pelvis into foot plant. Maybe they're trying to stay square or whatever it may be. Maybe they don't have the mobility to do so. But if you land with that pelvis square and no separation, basically you're, you're putting yourself in a really mechanically inefficient position to, to rotate and to swing the bat. So that's going to create a couple things. Like it's going to force the pelvis and torso to rotate kind of together to get the bat to the zone or the other compensation is they're going to have to really use their hands and, and just like sweep the bat across the zone. And that's usually when you see like that big, like pronate turnover move with the bat. Um, it's all because they're not landing in a, in a sort of torqued position, <laughs> if you will. So an, another uh, common flaw is, is that is the opposite, which would be the pelvis is turning in the foot plant, but that torso comes with it. Right. So that again could be, due to mobility issues or, you know, a hitter that's scared to get jammed. We'll see this a lot with guys that, that hit like a lot of fastball machine. They don't want to get jammed. So they kind of cheat it and just like fly open and, and, and kind of sweep the bat through the zone. But 
we want that torso to stay closed to create that stretch. And if that torso comes with the pelvis, it, it really it can negatively impact your, your direction and, and cause a like an out and around fat path. So just some data on that. On average, the separation at, at heel strike is about 18 degrees. And again, there's some variation. Your more looser movers will be on the higher end, um, even over 25, 30 at times. Uh, for what it's worth, the, the average max separation in the swing for our, our big league haters is about 22 degrees. So it's, it's not as much as you might think. And I think in the hitting world, we initially probably thought that, you know, myself included, like separation creates power, more is better. But in a, in a skill of hitting where, uh, you know, velocity and, and, and quickness is so important, um, you know, I don't think it's as simple as more is better, right? It's kind of like finding that sweet spot for the hitter. And um, 22 degrees is, is about what our average is. It is our average for, for big league hitters. And, and I think just again to reiterate that separation within the uh, the biomechanics software is it's that is the X factor. It's probably the biggest thing I've gotten questions about. So you can see in this example, Dom here at heel strike is at uh, 24.4 degrees of separation there. So that would probably fit pretty darn close with with what you would look for. Yeah, if anything, a tick on the high end. I mean, the thing that stands out when I look at this is just the 41 degrees of torso. Like he's really turning a ton. Right yeah, yep. it's just a, it's a long way to move to, to get to the hitting zone. Mm -hmm. The second checkpoint of the stride is is um, more related to torso posture. So looking at forward bend, and this is basically the chest moving forward. And you can see this well in the Freddie Freeman gift, just kind of thinking about as that foot gets down, as he starts to swing, you can see his posture is, is set. Um, and with our data, they on average is about 25 degrees of forward bend. And this will alter a little bit based on the hitter. But um, a really common flaw is, is hitters landing with too much forward bend. So this will this would be getting into the, like the 32, 35 range and more. And the reason that's a problem is that that forward bend will kind of set your swing plane. And a big part of hitting is adjusting, right? Especially to pitch height in this situation. So it's a lot easier to adjust top down when it comes to the swing than, than to work down up. So if you're landing on a high pitch posture, which is something we talk a lot about at driveline, it's it's much easier to, to start your swing, start your turn and add side bend to adjust to a pitch that's working down than it is. It's a lot easier than, let's say your, your 35 degrees of forward bend is grooving you to the middle down. And now you start your swing and, and now you're trying to remove um, forward bend and get to that high pitch while resisting side bend in the rotation. It's just a really hard move. And this is something we see with a lot of our hitters that struggle with fastballs, especially fastballs middle up. A lot of times they're just landing with, with too much forward bend. And you can see in the graph here with um, in the visual with Dom, he's landing at 29 degrees of forward bend. Um, that getting close to, to, to the high end, I, I would probably encourage him to, to be a, a tick more upright. At the very least, I would I would try it with him if I was working with him. So a couple of drills for the stride phase walkthroughs. I, I really like it's, it's a simple drill in, in this video example. Um, he's stepping in front of his foot. I also like stepping behind. Um, let me go back to that. Uh, it's just a good rhythm drill. It helps, it helps guys control the forward move and, and the stride and, and gives them good direction through, through the baseball. The second one, hard soft flips is a is staple with, with hitters I work with. And the idea is kind of related to that adjustability component and that ability to control your forward move and, and be dynamic in the timing between foot up and foot down and the timing between, um, you know, foot down and your hands firing, like all those things that make hitters good. Just adding some some variability as far as pitch speed in your training is a great way to just naturally develop that. Right. Because when you think about the hitters will their swings will become, you know, they will develop based on the environment you put them in. And if you're always grooving them to the same pitch, you know, to their, to their a, a swing, just like flipping it or throwing it to their sweet spot. And they're never adjusting the pitch location or, or speed. 
their, their swing will adjust accordingly and they'll have a very grooved, repeatable swing. So doing hard soft lifts is a really good way to get guys mostly subconsciously to, to learn how to control their stride and, and be more athletic as they, um, as they work from the load through the stride. So moving to the last phase here, talking about the swing um, purpose is uh, kind of obvious, but just accelerate the bat efficiently to the baseball. Big part of the swing phase is being dynamic and, and having many lanes to travel through, right? So this graphic here is, is all swings from the same hitter, same big league hitter. And you can see there's just different subtle mechanical attributes that contribute to his ability to get to, to so that ability to, to be dynamic and you swing at a high lane, swing at a pitch down the zone, like whatever it may be, work with your hands really tight inside for inside pitch. It, uh, it's all part of, of the swing phase and something we look at. And then um, swinging on plane, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, bat path in this section, I'm talking about direction or horizontal attack angle and, and vertical attack angle, which we'll get into. So checkpoint number one, especially when it comes to looking at biomechanics, we talk about upper body connection into disconnection. So what that means is the connection is happening between the torso and the arm, the hand and the bat, right? So if you look at these gifts of Pete Rose and Trout, we're talking about the, the early stage, like the first half of the swing phase, as soon as that torso starts to begin rotation, all those segments are actually connected. And you can see that on a kinematic sequencing graph. They'll, they'll be just sort of one line connected. And as the torso turns, eventually that torso will start to slow down, right? It'll it'll slam on the brakes, maybe a little earlier for a pitch that's that's gonna be a deeper contact point to, to the opposite field. If, it, if, it's, if they're going to hit it out front, they might hold it a little longer, turn a little bit more, but eventually the torso is going to slow down and then basically catapult the hands and the barrel into the baseball, right? So you'll see there's a connection phase, as we can see in these GIFs, where the torso, arm, hands, and bat are really just turning as one unit before they release and go with good direction towards the baseball. So when it comes to... Um, Common flaws, we'll, we'll see a push pattern. So this is when hitters initiate their hands and arms too early. So there isn't any connection. And what happens is the hands kind of like almost chest press the bat and, and they release from the torso too early. The second is a drag pattern, which would be the, the opposite, which is more common in, in younger, weaker hitters. So as that torso begins to ro rotate, instead of it being connected, the hands are actually dragging behind and and kind of falling back and oftentimes the barrel will will drop as well so you can see that in a, in a sequencing graph if you look at just the the arm in relation to the torso so on on this particular graph here the uh the hit tracks one you can see that the green line is the lead arm and the red line is the is the torso so you can see that the green line is is below the red line, which would indicate that at any given point in time, the arm is actually traveling slower than the than the torso, meaning that's actually dragging behind just a little bit. And if it was a push pattern, you actually see the green out in front. So it's moving faster than the torso early. So that inefficiency will often lead to poor speed gain between segments. So what that means is comparing the peak speed of one segment to the next. So when we look at like, okay, the pelvis rotates at 600 degrees per second, and then, you know, the torso rotates at 900. Uh, the, the difference in speed between those segments is what I refer to as speed gain, what people refer to as, as speed gain. Um, so you can see with Dom here, and Dom, I hope you're not watching some kind of crushing your swing, but <laughs> the, uh, the, tor the, the speed gain between the torso and arm is just minimal, right? There's barely any speed gain between those two segments. And it's likely to do with um, that drag that he's showing there. And I know from watching the video, he's got like a huge arm bar and, and that there, there's, there's some more in the tank there. If we could get a better energy transfer from, from torso to arm, I think we could unlock a little bit more bat speed for you there. Dom, for the record, Dom does own up to that. He, he, he's, he's very self-aware of that. <laughs> okay. Um, and I want to, I want to show too, while, while we have that here, because this is, this is something that this is the default page of, 
of the biomechanics spot, right? So you're seeing uh, the rotational velocities throughout the swing. You see the graphs on the right, but if you hit this icon right here uh, next to the pelvis, that's going to actually pull up the velocity for the pelvis and you can toggle on the shoulders and the front arm. Okay, so I, I'll tell you, uh, Oach, I get a lot of questions on this part too. It's like, you know, and, and, and if you're going to get to this in a minute, let me know, but like, what, you know, what is a good rotational velocity? What should the pelvis be at, at a peak? For example, we see Dom here at 761. And then if we move this over to, you're right, you know, the shoulders uh, are at 1250 in this case. And, and the front arm actually on this swing is, is not as fast. It's even, it's even less. This is 1150. So, I mean, can you just talk me through, you know, some velocities here and, and what kind of, of separation are you looking for for each of these? Is there is there a, a set number? Is there a set peak velo that a guy should shoot for? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I can get some of that data for you. Usually, yeah, the pelvis, you want it to be at least in like the mid 600s. Um, the, tor the torso, you know, like yeah, up to 1100, 1200 is good. And, and we definitely want to see the, the front arm <laughs> moving faster than the, the torso. Um, usually the speed gain from pelvis to torso, you want it to be at about one six, one six. And then, um, from lead arm to, uh, from torso to lead arm, like I mentioned, uh, one, two, one, three at the very least. So, so in this example, like you see the green line, which is his front arm is, is below, well below the shoulder. So that just kind of reinforces probably even more so on this swing that, that drag, um, rather than you know, staying connected with, with this torso and, and, uh, and pelvis. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, correct. And, and when I look at this, I mean, his, yeah, it's, it's a very shouldery swing. Um, and I think because he has no sort of like release, we talk about connection and disconnection, there's no disconnection of the arm here. So he's really relying on shoulder rotation to execute his swing. So I think that's why he really turns a ton. And then the other thing too, is the pelvis, rotation should be first and you can see them kind of all starting together um so so that would be like one of those flaws i mentioned earlier where the pelvis and torso turn together and there's no separation that's the other thing so that that's where it's like the chicken or the egg kind of thing comes into hitting and that's where the art of of coaching comes in and and just being able to trial and error try different things so it's like all right we we see a few flaws here like your pelvis is not rotating independent of your torso there's poor speed gain torso to arm how do we actually like identify what's causing that and, and actually see real time um, improvements. And, and the thing that's been hard, like historically with, with any sort of biomech data is like the turnaround time to get this stuff is it, just hard. But now with this technology, it's like that ability to <laughs> try something, try a swing thought, try a drill, uh, whatever it may be, and see if it improves like right away and then pair it with video. It's just so powerful. And I, I think it's gonna help a lot of coaches help their players. I think that video kind of showed that arm bar pretty significantly too. Yeah. Um, all right. A few more slides. I'll cut it down to the wire on, on time. So I'll move quick. But um, the second checkpoint is, is maintaining posture. So what we mean by that is as the hitter gets down to the, to the, um, the heel strike and the start of the swing phase, we can measure that forward bend. And then that forward bend is going to be replaced by side bend at the swing. So essentially the swing from a very basic description is, is a tilted rotation of the body, right? So that ability to swing on plane and, and be efficient with your swing plane is reliant on that ability to set your forward bend and then replace it with side bend so that you can swing through an axis, right? So one way you can look at that on Hit tracks, as, as you can see here, I, I took a couple uh, screen grabs of, of, of heel strike and impact, and you can see the postural measurements and visuals on the right. So at heel strike, Dom is at 29 degrees of forward bend. And then at impact, he's at 28 degrees of side bend, right? So he's basically, he went from 29 to 28. So he is replacing his forward bend with side bend. And that is, is critical to... To being able to accelerate the bat on plane and in an efficient way. So a couple of flaws that are that are common. Early extension is the main one. This is really common with um, you know weaker hitters. But if they land at say 25 degrees of, of forward bend, 
And as they start to rotate, they stand up, right? Or they get early hip extension. It'll, it'll change that um, angle. So now they're trying to rotate a barrel, a bat, you know, into the hitting zone while the axis is moving, right? It's just a really hard thing to do. Um, so early extension is something that you can track on video, but, but now you can just track it on a hit tracks just by looking at how the hitter is, is taking forward bend and turning it into side bend. And then another flaw is, is kind of what we referenced earlier. Um, it's just gro having groove side bend to that low pitch. So a lot of, a lot of hitters, um, as they rotate, like, especially cause you're tilted forward, your momentum is naturally going to pull you kind of into side bend. So think about like a, a little kid that's like just learning to hit, you know, like what happens is like they, they drop their, their torso a ton, right? Cause as you rotate, that's just kind of the natural momentum. So a lot of hitters have to actively work on swinging. And if they're side bending underneath the amount of forward bend, that would be what, what I'm referring to here. So being able to um, teach guys to, to rotate and not drop underneath their swing plane is sort of the, the opposite swing flaw, which is common. And this is, these are your guys that like swing underneath the ball a lot, lose their barrel behind them. And these are the ones that really need to feel like above the ball or working down, you know, and, and we'll, guys like that will do like heavy bat, high pitch work and stuff like that. High T, like just to kind of get them to resist that natural urge to, to side bend as you rotate. Checkpoint number three is, is working behind the ball. So this is something coaches have been talking about forever, but more specifically from a biomechanics perspective, we're looking at as soon as that front foot gets down and the torso starts that rotation, right? The swing face starts. We don't want that head to be moving forward anymore, right? Because it's now basically gone from a linear move into a mostly rotational movement. And for that to be efficient, we need that head to be still so the barrel can work around the body, especially on the A swing, right? If you start seeing like guys that are like adjusting way out front and stuff like that, then we'll see some head movement, but we're talking about an A swing, looking at these two videos of, of uh, Bryce and, and Kutch. I'll go back, so play Kutch again or not. Um, you, you could see that that head, when it gets into that circle, as they start their swing, it stays still and they rotate around it, right? So um, on hit tracks, I thought this visual was really, really cool. It can show you head movement throughout the swing and you can kind of scrub through the swing and, and look at how the head is moving both uh, vertically and, and then horizontally and also the angle of the head, if I'm not mistaken. So it's just a really cool tool, something that I'm, I'm really looking forward to messing around with some more, but we can look to see if, if the hitter, once that foot gets down, is that head still moving forward? Because what happens when that head keeps them uh, keeps moving forward after foot plant is the barrel drags behind because it's now an inefficient rotation. And it's, it's the example I always use with hitters is relatable. It's like when when you do that, when you're throwing, like when you really keep moving forward, when you throw like that arm drags behind, that's sort of the, the counter effect of that inefficient um, rotation. And then it's the same thing happens in hitting. If the hitter continues to drift forward through the swing, that barrel is going to kind of, as, as a reaction, it's going to drag behind and it creates some issues with your path. I, th I think, again, just a quick point. This is something that, you know, everybody has has talked about. Not I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people talk about that linear, linear movement becoming rotational, right? And if you've done a good job in the load phase and in the stride phase of putting yourself in a good position, you know, then your ability, which is very important to stop at heel strike and, and, and become rotational, watch the head movement, you know, tracking the center of mass that really ultimately should, should probably, um, I'm kind of guessing here, you correct me if I'm wrong, but stop going forward or maybe even regress a little bit if their hips are opening up. Um, but that point from transitioning to linear to rotational is a huge piece that has been talked about before. Now you're just, you know, quantifying it. And hopefully that makes sense with how you can track that. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Um, as far as the swing phase, um, the fourth checkpoint is, is bat path. And like, I could talk for an hour about bat path alone, <laughs> so I'll, I'll spare you. But, um, basically when we look at how the bat is moving through space, um, we, we can think about it 
vertically, right? So how is it moving up and down in relation, like say to the ground? And then horizontally, which is sort of left to right if you're looking from the catcher to the pitcher. So um, I think attack angle is is pretty common in, in hitting um, nowadays where guys understand the value of vertical attack angle. So generally speaking, I, I think big leaguers are about eight to 10 degrees on average. Some of your more power hitters will, will be up in the 14, 15 range, which um, seems to come with some swing and miss, um, which, which makes sense when you think about the incoming pitch of the uh, incoming plane of the pitch is typically around like seven, eight degrees um, for the most part. Some of the more extreme, like four seam fastballs will be around five, six degrees. Um, but, but for the most part, you want to swing on plane because it gives you a wider margin of error to, to make timing adjustments. And then also maybe just as important is it's an efficient collision of bat to ball. So you're, you're taking your bat speed and turning it into exit speed by hitting it flush and you're not clipping the ball or having inefficient collisions resulting in too much uh, spin or, or um, you know, just balls that aren't going to travel as hard or as far as they potentially could considering the given bat speed. So uh, the other one, horizontal attack angle, I think is, is relatively new and it's, it's really interesting. And at, uh, this visual on the top right kind of depicts what I'm explaining. So if you think about the sweet spot of the barrel, if you look at it from an overhead view, what's the direction of the bat through impact. And one thing we found at driveline is our, our best hitters, like our, our big leaguers, generally speaking, do a much better job of working through the baseball and maintaining direction uh, through the incoming horizontal pitch plane through contact. So they're able to kind of swing through the baseball, if that makes sense, where a lot of our lesser skilled hitters, they get their barrel out and around early and they're, they're actually coming out to in through contact. And that is, uh, as we mentioned before, like just a really inefficient way for a bat to strike a baseball. So as far as uh, common flaws, down and across, bat path, see it a lot with players that come in. Um, you know, that vertical attack angle is working down, you know, either negative or close to zero. And then it's working across. So those are two ways to, um, you know, to, to get a hitter to, to get better really quickly, honestly, is to clean up their bat path. And a lot of times we'll have guys with, with good bat speed, good bat to ball skills, but like their path is so inefficient that they're just not performing even close to, to how good they could be. And when you clean those things up, you start to see their performance really, really improve. So as far as drills, um, hitting plows are, are probably my favorite, especially when you're talking about direction and and vertical bat angle so like or vertical attack angle sorry like getting getting guys to swing through the ball these heavy they're heavy sand filled baseballs that will just sort of implicitly teach your hitters to have good angles and and have a good attack angle and and direction through the baseball because if you don't it's just going to like spin off your bat so using those in your flips overhand toss i really like angle toss like if you have one of those guys that's working out and across doing angle toss from the opposite field with hitting plows is, is just a really good way to basically expose their swing flaw and force them to, to make the adjustment they need. Smash factor balls are another one. It's, it's sort of like plyos and, and they're like hard um, foam baseballs that, that have the same function as the hitting plow, except you could put them through a pitching machine. So the, these are a big hit amongst our hitters. Um, we use them like every day. And we'll use them on the on the junior hack attack or a big machine and 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 have guys really focus on on the bat ball collision and their their angles. Offset rotation is another staple. So this image I know is really small, but but the idea is the hitter is going to start open. So they're going to do 25 degrees to 35 degrees. They're going to set up open and stride in the direction where they're set up and ha try and hit the ball down the, the middle of the cage. So it's demonstrated here with the T, but I, I should prefer it on flips. Um, if they do that rep successfully, then they jump to a regular swing. If they do that successfully, they go to a closed swing and they switch through it. So it's, it's more of a uh, random and block type practice intentionally because we want our hitters to be dynamic in, in that torso rotation. So like you saw earlier, how hit tracks can show you torso rotation at different points of the swing. One thing we've seen is the hitters that can successfully hit the ball to all fields 
are able to change the amount of torso turn they have in the swing, um, in particular at contact and when they begin to slow down, right? Which makes sense when you think about the direction that's required to hit a ball well, let's say to the opposite field, you need to swing a little bit more into out. So in order to do that, the hitter needs to like slam on the brakes, so to speak, of their torso and swing down the line, swing into out to, uh, to, to su successfully hit balls that way without side spinning them or clipping them. So the best hitters are able to do that on a swing by swing basis. And this drill just naturally will teach them to get to those different amounts of torso turn in the swing uh, just by giving them an outcome of like hit a line drive in the middle of the cage. And instead of doing like angle toss, which is essentially the same thing, we move the hitter and it makes it easy to just to switch rep by rep. And if you do some plyos with that too, it's, it's a great combo. Um, last one is around the world. Similar concept, except we're changing the ball flight. So we'll have the hitter go oppo, center field, and then pull in that order. So if they hit a ball well to oppo, move on to center field, then to pull, just kind of giving the hitter a, a little bit more um, of a challenge in practice by instead of doing like a whole round oppo, then a whole round of center field, we're, we're changing it rep by rep. And then low to high is, is a variation of around the world, which is when they go oppo, they have low ball flight. So hit a ball hard on the ground or like below zero degrees. If you're on hit tracks, maybe below five. And if you do that, then you go to, um, you know, head high line drive, eight to 10 degrees to center field. And then when you pull it, hit it in the air, hit it, you know, 20 to 35 degrees in the air. And the reason we do this is it kind of counters the average miss for most hitters. If you look at spray charts, most of the outs to the opposite field are going to be like your flares and your fly balls. And most of the outs to the pull side are topped ground balls. So the low to high drill is sort of enforcing the ball flight we want to both fields. So that's that's one I really like. And for, for what it's worth on that, you really forced us to, not you, but you driveline as a whole and your philosophy there forced us to build some training games that do that. So you pick your angle, your side of the field that you want the player to hit and simple fast pay, uh, uh, pass fail, they'll get a point or they won't if they execute in that situation. So um, those, those kind of barrel controlled games uh are fun for players to do but also i think like you, you just pointed out just awesome for you know working on those bat to ball skills totally so uh yeah shameless plug where to learn more um just wrote a book i co-wrote it with max dudo and um who's the director of player development at driveline and a handful of other people contributed it's um got all the the, the bow mechanics like a lot of the visuals you saw that weren't hit tracks visuals are from the book the sections are skill development and, and motor learning, you know, anatomy, physiology, hitting, hitting bow, bow mechanics, um, assessments. We go over like the big three, which is our model for, for thinking about hitting and assessing hitters. We go into drills, our programs, all the tools we use, in-season programming, off-season programming, um, you know, programming for specific swing flaws, bat speed. Bat speed programming, bat to ball skill programming, swing decision programming, so on and so forth. Um, it, it's uh, it was a monster to write, I and mean, finally it's done. I'm happy about it. Uh, we have a code hit tracks 25. If you use it, you get 25% off now through the 18th. Um, and I think it pairs well with this sort of technology because there's a lot in the biomechanics section that you guys can reference. So, for instance, there's like three graphs in here. I'll, I'll go over really quickly. This is hip shoulder separation. So the blue, this is like an overhead view. The blue shaded lines show where our best hitters fall. So it's like the average plus or minus one standard deviation of, of where they fall as far as how much their pelvis and torso are rotated at different positions in the swing. And then this graph here is the entire swing. So it kind of gives you some context. So, I, I, you know, like the questions Andrew asked earlier, like how much X factor is good, what's bad, you know, like a lot of that we don't know. And, and these are charts that like, I reference these all the time. I have them like pulled up on one of my monitors, like all the time when I'm going through biomech information. Um, you'll get positional data and velocities of different segments at, at all these phases that we talked about. So like the second one is um, stride phase position. So looking at, Pelvis rotation, forward bend, and side bend throughout the entire stride and how those things interact with each other. Um, and same with the swing, just looking at sequencing like we talked about earlier. 
um, speeds, how they how they compare to other big leaguers, so on and so forth. So yeah, I, I think it's a good tool. Um, if you like it, uh, let me know, check it out. But that code is, is active for another week or so. Um, hit tracks 25 for 25% off. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I think, again, the, re the reason that we kind of put this webinar together is because people have utilized uh, this software, you know, the, the ProPlay AI integration, or maybe they've done it separately somewhere else. And, and there's been a lot of questions about, you know, what does this information mean? And I, I can tell you, I've, I've read the book. Um, everything that we talked about here is one chapter of it. I could not recommend more. Uh, getting this program and starting to dive into this. Because as you see, Jason and, and Max, they're able to communicate the information in such a way that everybody can understand this. This is not like, like I mentioned at the top of this, you know, you don't necessarily need a degree in this realm to understand what you're talking about here and to learn new things. Um, so I think it's a great game plan to start with this webinar start dipping your feet in the software, which in addition to the biomechanics software, if you're interested in testing it out, if you have a hit tracks, um, reach out to us. I've got a, a free trial that'll, uh, that'll get you 30 days free. And then you can extend into this book um, and really build out an entire program. I think it's, it's a game changing uh, piece of information. Um, so on that note, uh, I know we've got some questions. Let me, uh, let me see if I can pull this up. We'll take a few seconds here and, uh, and see if we can go through the Q and A. Give me a second. Um, okay, so let's take a peek. What do we got? What do we got? Uh, well, there's a good one. In your opinion, who has the greatest swing of all time? You can take. You can answer that while I find one of these other questions. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Um, I want to go with Griffey. I agree with that. That's pretty sweet. Um, the prettiest swing of all time. Let's let's take this. Uh, so as far as head movement, you talked about head movement a little bit, right? Um, this is uh, this is a question regarding hitters that have issues with head movement. Have you seen any other common issues that cause the head to move a lot, whether it's in strider or probably more more so after at or after heel strike? Are there any other indicators that show head movement either vertically or, or horizontally? Yeah, I, th I think landing at the wrong posture will force head movement, right? So we talked about landing um, with the correct amount of forward bend. Like if, if you end up too upright, which, which I think is, is somewhat common too, is a lot of hitters that are getting taught to like stand really tall. Um, and it's especially true when guys practice like like dry swings. Like I'm not a big like dry swing guy. Like if you do a lot of dry swings at slow speed, what it does is it like actually gets your posture more upright. So they get used to standing really tall. And then now when you're in the game and you're trying to swing at, at your game speed, it's like your, your swing is going to pull you forward because it's a tilted rotation. Um, so if you're landing that upright and now you're trying to swing, it's going to force your head to, to kind of dive. Um, so that's something I've seen in, in regards to that. Well, and I guess on top of that, this kind of goes with that question from Mark. Um, he's asking, you know, doesn't forward bend depend on how high or low the pitch is. So like when, when are you seeing the players react to that? I know you mentioned that briefly, but um, what are you seeing with forward bend, you know, translating the side bend depending on pitch location? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I think, I think that's why at the end of the stride phase, so at heel strike, we want the hitter to be set at that high pitch posture. Cause at that point we don't know where the pitch height is yet. Right. Um, so the side bend will, the side bend mostly will will be impacted by pitch height more so than forward bend. Actually, the forward bend is going to be pretty standard, like you saw with with uh, that Miguel Cabrera gift. Like as he's getting into foot plant, like the forward bend is pretty pretty standard. But as he starts to swing, it'll adjust for pitch height. It'll adjust uh, the hitter will adjust with side bend, and the forward bend actually turns into how guys adjust for contact depth, which is actually kind of a hard thing to understand, I think, without me demonstrating in front in front of you. But like, if you look at our our highest, like the highest bat the ball hitters, they're able to land, and if they need space out front, they can forward bend and swing, right? So when you look at like an A swing for most hitters, what they'll do is they'll land, they'll start the turn, 
they'll turn that forward bend into side bend. The pelvis is going to like posteriorly tilt underneath and the chest is going to work back, right? Guys will usually be at like negative five ish degrees of, of torso bend, which kind of helps set that attack angle, positive attack angle we talked about. Um, but the best bat ball hitters have that ability to, to not lean back in their swing and actually like swing and move forward if they need space out front. It's, it's actually something I wasn't expecting to find when I really got into the, some of this data. Um, so it's another area where, where, where good hitters have adjustability where others don't. And that's being able to rotate and control how much forward bend you have based on the, the pitch depth. Well, and it, it, there's, there's so many, uh, gifts of like, one of the most incredible things, like, is there's that, that, uh, that clip of, um, oh, I forget who the player is, but it, there's a pitch that's, that lands like 10 feet in front of home plate and he gets fully swings on it and, and he's out in front. But what's so impressive is that his, really his, his center of mass and his legs, uh, are not necessarily swaying forward, Right. He's he's still staying over his body and he's still staying controlled. But like you said, his hands and his and his torso may be going to get that pitch in that adjustment. And it's one of the most incredible things because when you look at amateur players, oftentimes that's when you might see like the front leg break down and the entire body go forward to get that pitch. Yep. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, this one actually, I kind of had had this question myself. Uh, maybe maybe you can help answer it. Um, uh, how do you define pelvis sway? Um, you know, you have, you have the center of mass and then you have pelvis sway and, and both are kind of moving together. Do you, do you have a definition of that? Do you describe what pelvis sway is briefly? Yeah. It, I mean, it, it depends who you ask. Like for me, it's, it's just the lateral movement of the pelvis or the center of mass really. So it's just moving to the right or left, I guess would be considered sway. It's not like a word I use a ton, honestly. Um, but traditionally the, the sway is, is the pelvis moving in a linear fashion to the uh the right for a right-handed hitter right what we talked about is like that first checkpoint in the in the uh the load phase like so, some might call that a sway um but that that's basically what that means okay i've been wondering that too so thank you for for clarifying that um all right let's get one more i know we're uh we're running along here there's some great questions here and uh if we don't answer any of these um, I'm probably, I'll take a snapshot of these and maybe we can carry it over to Twitter or otherwise, uh, after the fact, um, yeah, I can, I can definitely do that. I yeah. like this first one up here about bat the ball. Go ahead. The question is, have you seen any swing characteristics that have been related most to bat to ball ability? Um, I love this question and I've seen a few for, for one, it's uh, what I just mentioned with the, the ability to to change your amount of uh, torso bend and side bend throughout the swing phase. The other one, which I think is really interesting, is the ability to, to, to hit the ball and rotate the bat with different amounts of elbow flexion. So what that means is um, you can swing with like a chicken wing lead arm, so to speak, or you can extend it and uh and hit the ball with with both your arms at full extension or any combo of the two right so it makes sense from just like a logical standpoint when we talk about the swing it's like a tilted rotation and then the side bend and forward bend kind of change like where the axis is but the arms are like the lever right and if you could adjust that lever length with elbow extension i think it gives you another area another window of adjustability in the swing and it's something we've seen with our best hitters. Like if the ball's inside, uh, they can like suck their hands in, like turn, keep their, keep their elbows flexed and, and then release the barrel with their wrist and, and still get off like a really good swing. Or if they need to like get more bat, so to speak, they can turn, get to elbow extension while holding lag and then release the barrel out front. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty, it's pretty miraculous that they can do it against pitching at that caliber, but it's something I've seen amongst the best hitters. Well, and that's just something you keep referring to is the the adjustability, right? Like you talk about these, these positions, these core spots that you get into, but ultimately, you know, the baseball is coming in, doing different things at different times, spinning differently and at different velocities. So that adjustability and putting yourself in a position to do that is a huge, huge, huge part of it. And one, I mean, one of the things that, you know, not every swing is the same. 
there's no mechanical spot that you can get to to say this is the perfect swing. Well said. Um, okay. Uh, there's some other great questions here. Um, if you want to tackle any of these, you can. Otherwise, I may. Uh, I, I see Jake, great customer of ours, getting some good data on this. Maybe we can address that one on uh, on Twitter post session. A few other guys talking about um, the differences, you know, factoring in forward bend, you know, through swing rotation, et cetera. Um, I love this stuff. I think we're we're at an hour fifteen, um, so I'm going to keep these questions. Uh, and we will get back to you guys if you if you check us out on Twitter. It may not be today, but over the course of the next few days, maybe we can post some of these out there, Jason. Um, yeah. and, uh, and keep I'd love to do that. Going. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks, everyone, for, for listening. I mean, I, I love talking about this stuff. I have a lot to learn myself. And um, I'm excited, as I said earlier, for more people to get access to, to these tools and, and to start answering good questions and, and sharing. So. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's really good for for the industry, and I think we're going to learn a lot as a you know as the industry is as is hitting hitting coaches in the coming years. Well, I love it as as always. You're great. The knowledge you bring and the way you can communicate it is awesome. I think a lot of people are going to learn from this. Um, when you're done here, take advantage. Go get the book. Try out biomechanics on hit tracks powered by Three Motion AI. You should have a very good set of tools here to start putting some action in place um, and hopefully walking away with this with a lot of, of uh, great info and, and keep the questions coming. Jason, again, I thank you so much. You're the man. I appreciate it. And good luck this season. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you.